God bless the reading of his word. You guys can finally sit down for a little while. You guys have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to First Peter. And for the kids, you guys get to stay with us today. So you guys are stuck with this game. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You're, you're stuck with me today because that's, that's the schedule. First Peter chapter 1, jumping into verse 10. As we continue our series through First Peter, today it's entitled Prophets, Angels, and God. Prophets, Angels, and God. Three different people that we're going to look at. Some very interesting things about them. Verse in verse 10. As to the salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you and made careful search and inquiry. Throughout the Old Testament, we have over 900 prophecies just concerning Christ. Not to mention the passages of the New Covenant and the coming Messiah. We see passages such as Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, that specifically point us to Christ. That the prophets were revealed these things, but they also searched into them. That many of the writings, the, the Mishnah of the Old Testament, that they would dig into these passages and to expound them to their generation, looking forward to what Christ had done. Just as we should today, looking back on salvation, dig into them as well. You know, recently we just had PBS, and it was a treasure hunt, right? For those of us that were there, we get to be on a treasure hunt every week with God, with the scriptures, to dig deep and to find that hidden treasure, just as the prophets of old have dug deep as well. Your first moment of light this morning is the prophets searched. They dug. They looked intently. If you guys ever get an opportunity to look into the Mishnah, it continues even till this day. The, the writings of Jewish rabbis that have looked into the scriptures go well before the time of Christ and still continue to this day. In fact, you can in the Mishnah, you can read of Paul's teacher, Gilimel. He wrote and is collected in the Mishnah. And his, especially his writings on the Messiah, very interesting for the time, very telling of the, the deep digging into the scriptures in which they did. Verse 11 in 1 Peter chapter 1. Seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. The prophets, above anybody, wanted to know the Messiah. That's why in Jesus' time, many were led astray because there had been many Messiahs before Jesus. That is why the Roman government got sick of Messiahs. Approximately 250 years before Christ, we have a great rebellion that rose up in Israel, led by very fervent people that had crowned for themselves the Messiah. But it wasn't the true Messiah. After that point, for the next 250 years, it was Messiah after Messiah after Messiah. They would rise up and gather the people to go up against Rome, and then they would suffer greatly at the hands of legions and crucifixions. One of these such uprisings led to all of the insurgents, shall we call them, being crucified leading into town. Up to 300 crosses leading up into town to give any warning for the next Messiah that was going to arise. <clears throat> the prophets really wanted to see the sufferings and the glories that were going to follow the true Messiah. These are those things, no wonder, when you get to the Mount of Transfiguration. We've got the inner three, right? Peter, James, and John. They're there. And who did they see with Jesus? 
Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, all testifying as to Jesus is this final Messiah. What's interesting, in, especially in that passage, is how did Peter, James, and John know that it was Moses and Elijah? You know, in the paintings, we often see Jesus, and you know who Jesus is in the picture, but then you see Moses and Elijah, and they've got a little scroll underneath them that, that has their name. I don't think that that was there. <laughs> I don't think they had a name tag. Hi, my name is Moses. No, they knew. Just as the disciples eventually knew that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. For some of them, unfortunately, it had to be until after his resurrection. Yeah. Ask Peter about that one. Yes, he knew he was the Messiah, but Peter really didn't know he was the Messiah until after the resurrection. Until after he is restored. And coming up soon, we're going to be digging into that passage at the end of John. The different loves that are expressed by Peter and Jesus. Unfortunately, you don't quite get that passage in the English in the way it's presented in the Greek. The real conversation that's happening between Jesus and Peter. Verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. And these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things which angels long to look. The prophets worked diligently in bringing the message that God gave to them to the people. In Hebrews chapter 1, it tells us that in ancient times, God spoke to mankind through the prophets. But in these days, it's spoken to us through his son, Christ. That his word speaks to us of the fullness of everything that those prophets told Israel, told the nations, told the Gentiles of the Messiah that was to come. That it was their job. Multiple places in the Old Testament, God makes the analogy that they were to be a lighthouse even to the Gentiles. But what happens at the time of Christ? Were the Jews actively going and talking to people about God, especially to the Gentiles? No. Did they want to go and to tell the Samaritans about the God in whom they serve? No, the Samaritans had to have their own God and their own temple in which they went to worship. Hence Jesus' conversation. But what's interesting here in verse 12, not only did the, the prophets serve the people in telling them about what God was giving to them, but here Peter makes a very interesting remark that the, that the angels in are intent to even look into the salvation that we have in Christ. Somehow there's a disconnect. They, they have seen God work and they've been messengers to God's people and telling them about God's promises and what God is going to do. And coming and telling them about the coming Messiah, Jesus. But yet, they're not really a part of the story. They're servants of God, and yet they can't understand why God would redeem sinners like us. That, in, in many ways, they... Hope to look into the mystery that is salvation. Because unfortunately, the angels that fell have no redemption. Satan took a third of the angels with him. The scripture says that, that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection does not and cannot apply to them. Yet they're going, well, if, if salvation only applies for humanity, what is so special about humanity? What is so, so special? No wonder you guys recently went through a, a series in the book of Jude where it talks about an argument over the bones of Moses. What is that? It goes back to the same idea of 
Why are the angels looking into the salvation that we have in Christ? Why is it that they wonder about these things? Well, it goes beyond just the physical. It goes to the spiritual. It goes to the fact that this salvation in which the prophet served and brought to us was something that was begun outside of time and space, as we looked at Ephesians chapter 1, right? That before the foundation of the world, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit got together and made this plan, made this purpose. Some people will call it the decree of God. That even before he said, let there be light, this plan was put into place. It's hard for us to understand that because we're stuck in time. I'm stuck living this uh, 11 o'clock hour only once. And it will go away. Then we live the 12 o'clock hour and then the 1 o'clock hour. Yet God can see the beginning and end of time just as I can see this communion table. We don't understand that. We can't comprehend how a God can make a plan and a purpose to take this jar of oil and to place it at that particular spot. And to step out and not be captured by the time in which he's dealing with. No wonder it says that at the right time, at the appointed time, Christ came into the world. It's not bound by his creation. Unfortunately, total side note, extra five cents. There are some people in theology that are trying to say that God is bound by his creation. That his creation dictates to the creator who, what, where, how, and why he deals with his creation. I'm sorry, I can't find that in scripture. That he is somehow bound to it, both in time and in space and in his decree. Yes, he chose to place Jesus at that time and in that place, because it was part of his plan. Not because somehow Chris dictated the time and place for Jesus to come, or that anyone dictated the time and place, but it was in fact his time. Verse 13, Therefore, gird your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It says here to gird yourselves. That's an old word. Most of your translations still have that. We don't wear long cloaks like they did then. The idea was even the Roman soldier who wore a tunic on the outside, when it came time for battle, everyone would have a belt of some sort, whether it was a sash or whether it was another material. And to gird yourselves up especially for battle men, to take of the extra clothing that was especially below your knees and put it into your belt so that you could be swift for movement. So that you could run if you needed to, or that you could fight if you needed to. What's interesting in the martial arts world, we have something similar. The, the Chinese in Kung Fu, they wear these very long, ornate robes. And some of the movements in some of their forms, if you ever watch modern what's called wushu, and you watch some of the Shaolin monks, a lot of their forms start where they step. What they're doing is they're gathering up their extra cloth and tucking it into their belts before they start their fight. Paul, here Peter is telling us to gird up ourselves, to be ready for action, to take up that extra material, to not have it drag us down in the moment that we need to move. Big question is, is for us, what is that extra material? What is it that's dragging us down, that's not making us prepared and ready for action? Prepared and ready for the fight. Prepared and ready, as 1 Peter chapter 3, that we're going to get to in a moment, says for us to be, always be ready to give an answer. Just as you have an opportunity to be ready to give an answer this week. We all have those opportunities. I know Jordan, in the last several weeks, has had a lot of opportunity to give an answer to the hope that lies within us. Are you girded and ready? Or is things in life, such as what you wear, dragging you down to where you're not able to be ready? 
not ready to be able to give an answer. Your next fill in the blank this morning is to fix our hope on Jesus. To gird ourselves up, but to fix our hope on Him. As I said in my prayer this morning, and hopefully it is every Sunday, that as we're here, we're fixing our eyes upon Jesus. That the thoughts and intentions of our prayer, the thoughts and intentions in the words in which we sing, the thoughts and intentions in the scripture that is presented is on Christ. That we aren't focused on the things of the world, but instead the things God has for us. So much in modern Christianity, a lot of churches about what's going on day in and day out in the world. Church is one of those places that we have a sanctuary from it. In fact, that's what we call this space. This is the sanctuary. This is the safety from the things that go on in the world. So that we can fix our eyes on Christ. So that we can be ready for the coming week. So that we don't just come and to bring the stresses of the world, but instead that we together get to gird up ourselves, to prepare ourselves for the rest of the week. What's interesting, parallel, is in the Shaolin monks, for the, the higher monks that are a little bit older, they have a harder time girding themselves up, unlike the young sprightly, especially those little tiny monks that are the boys the size, and they're in the nice new robes, and they're, they can gird themselves up really easy. What will happen is, is that the, the men that are able surround and protect the older monks and help them gird up their loins, as it's called, to gird up their cloaks so that they too can fight. The church hasn't been doing that. The church hasn't protected the older to help them gird up their loins to prepare them for the battle that is to come. We have often left them on their own thinking that they can still do it. In many ways, we've gone the opposite direction. We've not protected the younger so that they can learn how to gird up their lives. Everybody in the middle is fine. Everybody in the middle is expected to know what to do. Just as Harold, when you were Call for action. Got 24 hours to get your, your gear in order and to ship out. You know what to do and you know how to do it. Mm -hmm. But what about those in the unit that haven't been on deployment? That was your job as a leader. It was those in the middle that were entrusted to make sure everybody was in order for battle. So much the scripture talks about spiritual warfare. So much of the scripture talks about that we are soldiers in Christ. Yet we push that aside and say, oh, I'm not signing up for service. There's a great cartoon on Facebook. Husband gets the mail. Wife's standing there. Husband shaking, has the letter in his hand. <laughs> honey, honey, what is it? What's wrong? Well, it's a letter from the church. We've been called up to active service. <laughs> True story. Yet, if they were ready, if they had girded up their loins, they would have been prepared to answer the call of the church. I've spoken with some of our young folks, and I probably don't want to scare them again, but... Spiritual warfare is real. Yes, amen. Mm -hmm. amen. To deny it is to be an ostrich and stick our head in the sand. That's not being prepared and ready, as Peter's going to tell us in chapter 3. To just blindly say that I can go along my way and just pray and I'll be fine and not realize that there is an enemy, that there are combatants, that there's not warfare that goes on even around us right now is fooling ourselves. The fact that we do need to be ready. But before we're ready, are we really fixing 
our hope on him. Come on. Verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. Do not be conformed to the image of this world. Paul said something important that has always stuck with me. That this morning, if you call yourself a Christian, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you've been called out from the world and to be joined with him, then the beginning of this phrase in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 should be true. Paul goes through this long list of sins, long list as he does. And then he says something interesting. And such were, past tense, some of you. Is it truly still past tense? Are our eyes fixed upon Jesus to where we can say that we were one of these things that Paul listed? And do we continue living as though it is and such we were, rather than inserting our present tense? Many churches still today, oh yes, Jesus is a great person, yes, he's provided salvation, but you, you, you still are this dirty, rotten, scoundrel sinner, and, and you can't help but being in it. Much like there are some recovery programs that still say that, that you are still that person. But if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. That was the old you. Now you have put on the new man, the new woman. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. You notice that here, all of these actions are the actions which God does on our behalf. He sanctifies us, he cleans us, he justifies us, he puts us in a right relationship with God. That through the power of the spirit, then we can walk as though we were that. That is the old Chris. That is the old man. Live in such a way that that is true. Fix our eyes upon Jesus and walk in that. Ready for whatever may come. Verse 15. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. This comes quotation right out of Leviticus chapter 19. And in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, approximately 300 years before Christ, the word there for holy is hagias. It means to be set apart, separate, for special service. That even the, the pots and the pans in the temple were hagias, holy, set apart for God's service. Well, if God can use a pot, he can use you. Yeah. If he has set you aside, then you are special for his service. Much like when you go to Jeremiah 18 and you see the potter and the clay. The potter shapes into whatever shape, whether it's a chamber pot or whether it's a wine goblet for the king that it's set apart for that very specific service. <clears throat> that he makes it holy. He makes it set apart. That if you are in Christ, you have been set apart for a very special service. Indeed. Whether it's downstairs working with our kids, whether it's Jonathan over there working on AV, whether it's up here singing or playing an instrument, no matter your role, you have been set aside for, as John would put it, a vocation. That your vocation in life is your calling. And that your calling is to be holy and to use whatever God places in front of you for him. That it is all to his praise and his glory. Every single thing from the school that you go to, to your work, or even in retirement, your vocation is to be for him. That if he has called you, if he has sanctified you, if he has set you apart to be holy, then we are to count everything as being for God. 
That if we fix our eyes on Jesus, everything becomes about Him. About His kingdom. About His purposes. His plan. Lord, not my will be done. Your will be done. Don't, don't we say the Lord's Prayer on earth as it is in heaven? How's that going to happen unless God's people consider this to be the kingdom that is to come? Indeed. Amen. Verse 17. And you shall address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each man's work. Conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay upon the earth. God is an impartial judge. Another discussion that's going on in Christianity right now, or really in theology, is there's many groups that are coming up, once again, in an old uh, false teaching that just says that when the unbelievers die, they cease to exist. It's called annihilationism. It denies the Father as an impartial judge. Because if we are, in fact, created after his image and after his likeness, that we take upon a new eternal nature. That eternal nature has one of two destinations for it to be righteous and just. If God offers eternal life in one hand, eternal consequence has to be the other. Mm -hmm. To offer annihilation, ceasing to exist, is unfair and unjust to those that have received righteousness. Indeed. It has to be both eternal salvation and eternal judgment. Or else God is partial, unfair, and unjust. Throughout scriptures, scripture presents God as an impartial judge. As being one that not only gives the law, but he judges by the law. And he then hands out or leads out the judgment. Here, Peter is telling us to be fearful. And in many cases, that word maybe means something different in each church. Do we really fear that the God whom we serve created the heavens and the earth? And as Peter's going to tell us in a little while, when it all is done, when it comes to a wrap, that this world is going to burn with a fervent heat, be literally burned up, the God that created it is going to destroy it and then recreate. Do we really serve that God? Or do we just serve Yes, a God who is love. This, this week I got to talk with a, a Mormon missionary online. And he posted, finish the sentence, God is... Number one answer was love. But in order for God to both have the qualities of love, perfect love, he also has to be perfect judge, perfect advocate, perfect savior. He cannot have any of these qualities be less than the other. Or else it negates his justice. It negates his mercy. It negates his very being. And yet that is what we all, whether knowingly or unknowingly, do week in and week out. As often we present to God that is just like, well then universal Universalism then must be true. Well, then all, all, everybody goes to heaven. Well, no. Scripture doesn't say that. Jesus said that there's going to be the goats that go to the wayside and go to eternal destruction. Then there's going to be sh the sheep that go on the other side that enter into their rest. To negate these things nullifies a lot of Scripture, and yet we knowingly or unknowingly say things in our prayers and in our conversations that make God partial. Let us be careful of the things in which we say that make God into an image that he hasn't presented us with. Verse 18. 
knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from the fuel way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. You were purchased with what? This is not like the temple, where for some sins you could bring in temple money mm -hmm. and to give to the church and, and your sins be covered for a time. It's not just the blood of bulls and goats that could only cover sin for a year. The blood of Christ, we have offended an eternal God. And we needed an eternal sacrifice. Us as temporal beings cannot give an eternal offering. So God himself from the beginning said this is the plan. Man is going to fall, I'm going to provide the sacrifice that only could appease him. That's why he sent his son to die as a propitiation, as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. Because we couldn't do it. What were you purchased for? In a little bit, we're, we're going to sing nothing but the blood. Kind of a perfect for this week. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can say. Because the life is in the blood. The Jews understood that. Many, in fact, the pagan religions of the world understood that the life was in the blood. Mm -hmm. That is why many of the religions of the world have sacrifices, because they understood that there was life in the animals that they were sacrificing. But it wasn't enough. It wasn't perfect. Every offering had spot or blemish. Yet the one that was given that was perfect and pure was the only one that God accepted. And that is Christ. Let us be like the prophets who searched and sought and served. Let us even be like the angels that look into these things are excited. The, the, the language that is used there is that they're excited to look at these things. Amazed at what God has done and is doing. And most importantly this week, let us fix our eyes upon Jesus. We have that hymn, don't we? Fix your eyes upon Jesus. It, it's in our hymn book. But it's not just a hymn, it's a reality from Scripture. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful morning. That we realize that you have given to us throughout time such a rich inheritance. Lord, that you sanctify us, that you justify us. Lord, that your spirit leads and guides us so that we truly can know a righteous judge. So that we can fix our eyes upon Jesus. Lord, now as we sing nothing but the blood, may these words ring true in our hearts and minds we realize that what Peter says and what Paul said and what the writer of this hymn say are the exact same thing. That nothing but the blood of Jesus can save. Lord, I thank you for those this morning that are here that in fact have been cleansed, have been washed, Lord, that if there's anybody here this morning that has not been, Lord, that your spirit would draw them. That it would do its job of convicting of sin and righteousness and drawing those in whom you will redeem to yourself. Lord, may as we sing this, we fix our eyes upon you and what you have done. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name.